Right then, seems that we are now getting to seven o'clock. We are going to make a start, all right? So welcome everyone. My name's Alan Tro. I'm from Dark Sky Wales, and I'm going to be your host for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour, where we have a look around the night sky as it is this evening. Now, luckily, the UK has some clear skies forecast for a change, so most of the things I will show you this evening, you should be able to see um, just after the session. So we're going to actually start off in the western part of the sky, just following the setting sun down. Now, if you pop your head outside or you can see a, a window and you can just notice the western horizon, it'll still have a bit of a glow to it at the moment. And that's because even though the sun has set, the sun's light still scatters above the atmosphere or the red light scatters uh, quite a bit actually at this time of year and um, we get to see this kind of nice glow on the horizon and that will disappear in about an hour and a half after sunset and once that's dipped down below the horizon and it's gone completely we get these wonderful dark skies across um, a lot of Wales and actually quite a lot of the UK these days but unfortunately if you are in a light polluted area then you're going to have this kind of permanent glow to the sky, uh, which can distract from your ability to see some deep sky objects. Stars as well can disappear uh, within that glow, but the bright stars, the ones that make up the constellations, will tend to be visible. It's only the really faint ones that you will lose. Now, having a little bit of light in the sky to begin with is, is actually a bit of an aid. Because, as I mentioned, it's only the bright stars that you can see through that um, twilight kind of sky. And when you look up, you are actually looking for patterns. And your brain is quite good at making patterns in the sky. And this is what our elders would have done many, many millennia ago when they first looked up and started to use the night sky uh, as a, a basic calendar. Now, some of the stars make very easy patterns to spot. And if you look just towards the top of the screen here, we have this wonderful W shape. Now, that W shape is Cassiopeia, just here. And Cassiopeia is probably one of the easiest groups of stars to spot. And it's quite a constant in our sky because the W shape is one of the circumpolar constellations, which means it's always constantly rotating around the pole star and it's visible all year round. And in fact, if we could get rid of the sun and just watch the, the pole star in that area of the sky, you'd see these circumpolar stars just making a big circle around the pole as it goes along. Now, if we move, oh, I got wrong. Apologies, guys. I want to get rid of that. If we go to the north, then we can come along and see another quite easy pattern of stars to see and this one is it goes without saying most people recognize this and it's known as the plow or the big dipper now in south wales we actually call it something else it's called the saucepan and you can see the bowl of the saucepan just there and attached to the saucepan is a handle and you can kind of make out what it's supposed to represent but it is called the plow and the big dipper and it's more familiar as those to most people, especially people um, across the Northern Hemisphere. But it, these two stars in particular are really important. They're known as the pointers. And if you use the pointers and just draw a line across the sky, the next star you come to is this one. And that is the North Star Polaris. Now, Polaris isn't a bright star. It's actually quite a faint star in the night sky. Now, a lot of people will have heard it, or oh, just go outside and look up and you'll see this bright star in the sky, that's your North Star. It's not true. It is quite faint and it's surrounded by faint stars. And the easiest way to, to find it is to go to the pointers and use them as your direction finders. And once you've got it, it's very hard not to miss it because, as I mentioned, 
there are very few bright stars in this area. But once you've got it, you've also got the end of the tail of the little bear, something called Ursa Minor. Now, Ursa Minor is also referred to as the little dipper. And you can just follow the handle down here, and then we get another bowl. And that is the little dipper. So you've got a big dipper just there. And you can see the one difference between them is that the handles actually bend in opposite directions. And you can see why this is called the big dipper and that one's the little dipper. They are vastly different in size. But you also will not be able to see the little dipper very well from any kind of built up area because the majority of the stars, oh, it's going a bit too wild there. The majority of the stars in the Little Dipper are quite faint. Polaris is okay. You should be able to see that once you've used the pointers. You can then see these two stars, which are the end of that bowl. But the four stars in between are very, very difficult and can only really be seen from a dark sky location. But both of these little and big dippers are parts of much bigger part of the sky known as the circumpolar area. And here we have several of those constellations. So there's Cassiopeia, that W. She's there with her husband, Cepheus. We have Draco, the dragon, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major. You actually have Lynx. Oh, let's get him right here. And Camilla Pardis. They are circumpolar constellations. So they're always there for you to learn and see. But one of the wonderful things about being able to use the constellations is that the asterisms within them actually set the constellations off. So when you look at the Great Bear here, you have again that big dipper shape. But you can also then extend forward knowing that you can find two additional stars, kind of like a pair of stars in front of the pointers, that then form a triangle. So it's kind of like building up a dot-to-dot -dot pattern in the sky. Start with the bright ones and then work off them to the fainter ones. And then when you get to these pair here, you just draw a kind of an arc which comes into another triangle and that will give you the bear's front leg. Then you kind of have this elongated rectangle representing the rest of the body before you have a little line down and then another big triangle of stars which represents the bear's hind legs and then obviously the tail. So it's a very easy way of building up the shapes and the patterns that you need to recognize to learn the constellations. So start off with the bright ones and learn from there. Now, the bright stars or the asterisms that we are seeing here are also linked in mythology. And to the North American Indians, these four stars, just those four, were a bear. And they were being followed by these three stars who were braves hunting this bear as it was wandering around the sky. Now, in the autumn months, the bear would be at its fattest and it was rising up, ready to uh, look to hibernate. So, but it, it was just ripe for picking. And these three hunters knew this and they would fire their arrows to kill the bear. Now, as the bear fell, the blood from the bear then dropped to the earth. And in autumn, the trees of earth would turn red, or the leaves of the trees in, on earth would turn red. And that was the blood from the bear falling onto the trees. And then over time, the blood would dry and turn brown. And it was a way of linking what was happening in the sky to the world around them. Now, these three braves didn't waste the bear. They actually carried a cooking pot with them. So this middle star here, known as Myko and Alzar, and if you are in a dark sky site, it's worth trying to see these two together with the naked eye because they are quite visible. 
And if you're in a built up area, just use a pair of binoculars to spot them. But basically, these or this story was a link to um, the rejuvenation of the earth because they killed the bear in the autumn. The winter would lay barren on earth. Nothing much happening with these hunters in the sky as they waited for the bear to be reborn. And then in the spring and summer, they would continue to track it until they would kill it again the following autumn. But it is this beautiful part of the sky that you need to learn because it's a consistent part of the sky. Those circumpolar constellations are not going to change. They will change positions, but they are not going to move over the course of a year, like the seasonal constellations will. So learn this part of the sky first. Feel comfortable in finding the star patterns and then move on. And when you move on, you can still use your pointers, your guides to find things. For instance, if you were to go through the pointers and in this direction, you'll end up at the constellation below known as Leo. And actually, at the moment, Leo is becoming quite prominent in the eastern sky. Now, you'll be fortunate tonight to, to see Leo because the moon is actually within the constellation. Now, the moon is a natural light polluter. And as you can tell, when you're out on a full moon, you don't need any kind of lighting around you to illuminate the ground. It's very, very bright. But what it also does is destroy any kind of faint objects and faint stars that are around it. But as I previously mentioned, the stars that make up the constellation should still be seen because they are relatively bright in comparison. And when you look at Leo, you have something around his head leading down to his leg here, known as the sickle or the backwards question mark. And that sickle or backwards question mark represents the lion's mane coming into his body. And then as you come down, this star here is a star known as Regulus, and it represents the heart of the lion. So it's a very easy one to spot. Now, at the rear of the lion, we actually have a right angle triangle. And the, this star here is a star called Denebola. And any star that begins with den means tail. So this is the tail of the lion. Now, originally, the constellation itself was much larger. And it would take into account these group of stars here. These would actually represent the lion's tail or the tuft on the end of the lion's tail which would have extended off the right angle triangle in the back there. Now, unfortunately, it's no longer part of the lion. And instead, it's a constellation in its own right, known as Coma Berenice, or Bernice's hair. And Bernice's hair is the only constellation in the night sky that is representative of a real person. Now, Queen Bernice II was the queen, uh, was queen to King Ptolemy III. Now, Ptolemy well, was not much of a warrior. He was more of an academic. And him and his father, Ptolemy II, had actually set up the library in Alexandria. So when he went off to battle one day to avenge the death of his sister, Bernice was quite worried that he wouldn't return. So in order to appease the gods and ensure his safe return, she promised to shave off her golden locks and place them in front of Aphrodite. So when he returned several weeks later from this campaign, safe and sound without a scratch on him, Bernice carried out her promise. She shaved off her hair and placed it at the altar of Aphrodite. Now, when her and her husband returned the next day to pray to Aphrodite, the hair had disappeared. Now, as you can imagine, no, they were neither pleased at this uh, turn of events, and Ptolemy was, was quite enraged. 
and started to cause a lot of damage within the temple. And it was at this point that the high priest Conan came out and told them that the goddess had been so pleased with the sacrifice that she had placed Bernice's hair into the night sky. In reality, he was quick thinking and just decided to chop off the tuft of the lion's tail and name it after Queen Bernice. But the great thing about finding the lion and looking at the moon is that when you follow it across the sky, you will actually come across something known as the ecliptic. Because here, this imaginary line across the sky is essentially the path that the sun takes through the sky. Now, as the sun moves around the sky in the course of its journey in a year, we're actually following the motion of our own planet with the orbit of the Earth just projected out into the night sky. And these constellations which lie on the ecliptic are commonly called the constellations of the zodiac. And most of you would probably be familiar with some of their names. So if we start over with Leo here, you get Cancer, then Gemini, Taurus the Bull, and then Aries and Pisces, just moving down to the others below. They are known as your star signs. And it's the location of the sun on the day of your birth. So the sun would have been in the constellation of Gemini, for instance. But in reality, since those star signs were first made, because of something known as precession, the constellations have moved. And they just don't match up with the original uh, position of the sun on the day of your birth. But it's also where you will find the moon and the planets. And as the term implies, ecliptic, it's where you will find lunar and solar eclipses occurring. But if we head back over to the western part of the sky, and you can see it's still quite dark, at the, uh, sorry, still quite light at the moment. We haven't quite reached darkness. And just go over to this northwestern corner. We do have quite a bright star here called Vega. Now, Vega is part of a constellation called Lyra. And we'll have a little bit of a look at that later on. But we also got a star here called Denebola. And remember what I said about tail? Den relates to tail. And this star is the tail of the swan. And you can see the swan's outstretched wings and his body and neck as he's flying down. And located on the swan is the Milky Way. Now, the Milky Way is not at its best at the moment. And unfortunately, we do have to wait till the very early hours of the morning to see the Milky Way rising. And as we go through the next few months, the Milky Way will improve um, as we go along until we get into the summer months where the Milky Way really does dominate the sky. But if you go back up, you will come across Cepheus, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, Pegasus, and Perseus. And these are all linked by a common story, which really revolves around Cassiopeia and this W shape in the sky. So if I just draw that W in again here, that W, or in this case, it looks a little bit like an M, represents the five bright stars that highlight the constellation. But when you look at the constellation, you're actually looking at a queen and she's the queen of Ethiopia. And her husband, Cepheus, here, is the king. And they're actually sitting upside down in undignified postures, which relates back to why they're in the sky in the first place. And that story really begins with this mirror in her hand. Because Cassiopeia would proclaim to anybody who would listen that she was the most beautiful woman in the entire world. Now, this upset a group of women called the Nereids, who were the sea nymphs. And one of the sea nymphs was actually married to the god Poseidon, so the king of the sea. And she wanted 
Cassiopeia to be punished for her vanity. So Poseidon released the sea monster Cetus from his undersea cave to come and destroy the lands over which Cassiopeia and Cepheus reigned. And to find Cepheus is not that, uh, sorry, Cetus is not that hard really because you can follow the V shape known as the Hyades of the Bull and then follow the stars down until you come to this circlet of stars. And that represents Cetus's head. And then he's kind of like a stringy long thing going down to the horizon. But this kind of half dragon, half whale kind of creature was released by Poseidon to come and flood the lands over which the king and queen reigned. Now, Cepheus didn't want his subjects to suffer. So he went and consulted with three wise witches. And these witches had the ability of foresight. They were able to see into the future. And these witches told him that the only way he could save his lands was if he sacrificed his only daughter, Andromeda. And if you look at Andromeda very carefully, and she's depicted like this in most renditions of the, of the story, she has chains around her waist and her arms. Now, she was chained to the sea cliff waiting for Cetus to arrive when the Greek hero Perseus flies over the whole scene. Now, to find Perseus, just use the W of Cassiopeia. So we got that W just there again. And instead now, use the two stars here, the kind of down slash, and they will take you towards Perseus. And you can see the outline of Perseus's shape with his leg and his kind of leg going over towards his shield, his torso going up towards his head. And then this represents his arm. But the key is actually these two stars. They represent the eyes of the Gorgon Medusa in front of him in his hand. Now, as Perseus was flying over this whole scene, he flew down and talked to Andromeda. Now, Andromeda explained the whole story to him. And instead of just releasing her, he had a bright idea of to, to fly to the top of the cliff and strike a deal with her father. And he told Cepheus that if he could have the hand of Andromeda in marriage, then he would save his lands and also Andromeda from the devastation of Cetus arriving. Cepheus was more than happy and it went as far as to say that he could have the hand in marriage of his daughter as long as he saved his lands. So off goes Perseus on the back of Pegasus and waits for Cetus to emerge. And as Cetus emerges, he pulls out the head of Medusa from a bag and turns the creature to stone with one gaze from Medusa. Now, you'd think that would be the end of the story, but Cassiopeia's vanity just went even further because now she didn't want Perseus to marry Andromeda. He just wasn't good enough for her. So she arranges with one of Andromeda's former suitors for him to come to the wedding day and kill Perseus. Now, Perseus was a friend of the gods. He had the year of them. And actually, they provided him with his shield, which was so polished that he was able to use it as a mirror to kill Medusa, that they told him what was about to happen now with Cassiopeia. So on his wedding day, in a nice velvet bag, he took the head of Medusa with him and he waited in anticipation of what was to come. And as the army burst in along with Andromeda's former suitor, he turned to her and asked her to close her eyes. She immediately did so. And out of the bag, he pulls Medusa one more time and turns the whole army and congregation into stone, including his future in-laws. 
And now he was king of the lands of Ethiopia. Now, that's kind of a long convoluted story, which was actually um, filmed by Hollywood several times. It's known as the Clash of the Titans. But to find Andromeda in the sky is quite an easy task because all we have to do is find this rather large square in the sky. And this square is called the Square of Pegasus. And once you've found it, it's quite an easy thing to do to recognize it because there's a lot of squares in the sky, but this is the only one which is big enough for you to put your outstretched hand on top of it. And if you do, so you got your hand out like that and you place it on the square, then you should still be able to see the four stars. If you can't, you've got the wrong square. So once you've found them, or found the, uh, the square, all you've got to do is come to this star here, which is a star known as Alpha Rats, and Alpha Rats is shared with Andromeda. And here you can see her. It's easier to remember her as a capital letter A because A for Andromeda. But once you've got it, you'll never forget it. And if you have a pair of binoculars at home, then by using these two stars here, all you have to do is draw a line between them, keep that line going for around about the same distance. So you're kind of in this area here and you will find the Andromeda galaxy. And there she is. Oops, get yeah, that off there. And there's the Andromeda galaxy. So just enough distance away. I want a question from Darcia. We'll, we'll get on to Mars and Jupiter in a moment, I promise. So there is the Andromeda galaxy. Now, the Andromeda galaxy is the most distant thing you will ever see with your own eye. It's around about two and a half million light years away. So the light from this object left um, the galaxy two and a half million years ago. And it contains on, we think, around about 500 billion stars. So it's a big old thing as well. And it's very similar to our own Milky Way in many ways, because here we have the core of the galaxy. And when we look at our Milky Way in the night sky in the summer months, we see the core to our galaxy. And then the outer regions, which are more bluey in color, this is known as the spiral arms. We'll also see dark lines. And those dark lines are known as dust lanes. So the best analogy is actually to think of it as two fried eggs placed back to back. The center or the core becomes the yolk. The white of the egg becomes the spiral arms and the burnt bits on the side become your dust lanes. Now, if this was our own Milky Way, we wouldn't be living in the center. We just wouldn't see anything else around us bar stars. So we actually live around about two thirds of the way out and up a little bit from the central line of the galaxy or the plane of the galaxy, which gives us a good view towards the middle, but also a good view out of the galaxy. So in the winter months, and particularly coming into the spring, when we look towards something known as the North Galactic Pole, all we see are other galaxies. And it's well worth having a look because even in a built up area, you may be able to pick it up as this fuzzy looking star. But if you place a pair of binoculars on it, then again, even in a light polluted area, you will be able to see the fuzzy star like shape, but in a dark area, so get away from the light pollution itself, you'll be able to pick up all those kind of dusty lanes coming out of it. It's, it's phenomenal to see. Now, this is just at the beginning of the night. So if we make it a bit darker by moving on an hour or so, you see that Andromeda is moving down towards the horizon. The square of Pegasus is now disappearing. But the one thing that starts to shine out the most is this part of the sky here. 
Now, this is known as the constellation of Orion. And if you use Orion's belt, these three stars here, they're known as Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka. If you draw a line between them and you go in this direction, you end up at the bright star. In fact, the brightest star in the night sky called Sirius, also commonly called the dog star, because it's part of the constellation of Canis Major. But if you go in the other direction, you'll end up at this V-shape known as the Hyades, which extends off to that star there and to that star there. They become the points of the horns of the bull Taurus. But if you keep going through, you'll end up at the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. Now, the Seven Sisters were the daughters of a god called Atlas. And Atlas was the strong man holding up the earth. Now, his daughters actually provide you with a good area of the sky to look with binoculars. And if you're looking with binoculars, because you just had the question here about which type, a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars would be ideal. But if you've got bird watching binoculars, so something like these, which are an 8 by 40, they will help you as well. Because all you're trying to do is make your eyes larger and binoculars will do that. And a pair of 10 by 50s is the ideal size because they're not too heavy and they're not too, well, not too heavy. So when you're holding them, you're not jiggering around too much. And when you look at the seven sisters, there is a blueiness around them. Right, guys, just had a message up. Is anybody else having trouble with the video? Are you able to see it all, guys? Right. It appears that my photo is frozen, is it? I do apologize. I'll put a picture up of the 10 by 50s after for you. Okay, so I do apologize on that. Right, so when you are looking at the Seven Sisters with your own eye, they look a little bit like this. But with binoculars, they're going to appear more like this, with a blueiness around them. And with a small telescope, they actually just pop into view um, like a jewel box. But don't look directly at them. Actually look at them with something called averted vision. So instead of looking towards them you will actually look off to one side of them and then out of the corner of your eye you'll be able to spot them very easily because they become quite bright and quite blue to see but use them as a guide because just below you have mars now mars well people love mars now the problem with mars is that it's not that spectacular even with a small telescope Mars only ever looks a little bit like a dot. Now, with a larger telescope, you will start to see some features appear in them, like this suit, this major here, this black patch. You'll also be able to see occasionally the polar region, so you get ice caps on them. But Mars has been quite popular in the news lately because of the Perseverance mission from NASA, which is now looking for the signs of life from times gone by. Now, when we think of Mars, Mars is actually the god of war to the, the Greeks, the Romans, and, and cultures all across the world. But when we think of Mars today, we always think of aliens. And that really stems from one person. And that person is a man called Percival Lowell. Now, at the beginning of, well, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, Lowell had got fixated on Mars. He was a businessman who'd been visiting all around the world and had visited observatories on his, his tour and gathered up a load of maps. And when he returned to America, he built himself an observatory on a mountain that he purchased and called Mars Hill. And one map in particular got his attention. It was a map produced by a man called Giovanni Schiaparelli. Now, Schiaparelli was an Italian astronomer working in Milan. And his map actually had 
dark lines on it. And these lines were all meeting towards the equator of the planet. Now, on the map, he wrote the word canali. Well, to Lowell, that meant canals. But in reality, it meant valley or channel. But if you had canals on Mars, you had intelligent Martians. And that was Lowell's idea. Now, most of the scientific community at the time would just poo-poo in it. But an English author got hold of this idea. His name was H.G. Wells. And he transformed that little bit of knowledge into a fantastic story about aliens from Mars who were on a dying planet coming to Earth and invading to save their own souls. Now, from a story perspective, it was fantastic and it still comes to life today. But we as human beings are now fixated on the possibilities of life on Mars. And in reality, Mars probably was warm enough and dry enough, uh, wet enough, a long time before the Earth. So it would have probably been the most likely plan to have life first in our solar system. And if that was the truth, and Mars, as we know, has been hit by meteorites in the past, then though that life could have been transported to our own planet 3.86 billion years ago, when life was first discovered to have existed on our planet. And it would explain the sudden rise in life here. And that's a theory known as panspermia, the transportation of life from one planet to another. And who knows, perhaps perseverance will provide us with that knowledge. But if we come back to Orion, Orion is the, the well, without doubt, the greatest constellation in the night sky. It eclipses all others just in its size, its brightness, and ease of finding things. Because again, when you go to the belt stars, if you drop down from the center star to these three objects here, they are known as Orion's sword, but they're not actually stars. You've got nebulae there, and it's known as the Great Nebula of Orion. And again, with a pair of binoculars, you'll be able to pick up this quite easily. All oh, right, guys, I just had a, a message saying the screen has gone dark. Is that the same for everybody? If you could let me know in chat. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Must be on someone else's screen, the problem. Okay, so when you look at the Orion Nebula here, the Orion Nebula is actually a big cloud of dust and gas. And this dust and gas is quite large. It's, it's around about 1,350 light years away from us. And when you think of a light year, you're actually looking at 5.9 trillion miles for light to travel in one year. And this is 1,350 light years away. So for us to be able to see it, it must be big. And we are calculating it to be around about 24 light years across. So it's, it's a massive object. Now, contained within it, we have four stars here known as the trapezium stars. And it's actually the biggest of those trapezium stars, which is lighting up the whole of this nebulae. And the reddy color of the nebulae comes from molecular hydrogen, where you get two hydrogen atoms joined together and they're absorbing this light energy and then re-emitting it at a slightly lower wavelength. And that is where the red comes from, because when you think in astronomy of a rainbow, a spectrum of light, red is cold, blue is hot. So you get short wavelength light, which is red, which carries less energy, and blue, which is longer wavelengths of light, carrying higher energy. 
So the red is low energy, cooler stuff, which is this cloud of, of material. But you also get blue, which is dust and gas, which is being hit by blue light. And it's actually not being absorbed this time, but it's scattering it or reflecting it. And they are known as reflection nebulas. So in this one, we've actually got the two. And in a pair of binoculars, this is what it's going to look like, this patch like this. But because our eyes don't really work that well in the dark, we see this as a, a grey green colour. And it's, it's well worth having a look, even from a built up area. But just above, uh, around the star Alnitak here, we have one of the most famous shapes uh, in the night sky. It's known as the Horsehead Nebula, just here. And the Horsehead Nebula is actually black or dark. And for because astronomers are not really creative, we call them dark nebulae. And it's just really where the dust and gas is so thick that we can't see through it with the lights of the stars behind. So they become quite dark in appearance. We also have one known as the flame nebula just above. And to see these, you really need to be in a very, very dark location, but also with a telescope, which is around about 200 millimeters in diameter or greater. They become very difficult to spot otherwise. But these two objects are actually dwarfed by this fainter one. I don't know if you can just make that out there, guys. This is known as Barnard's Loop. And Barnard's Loop is a huge molecular hydrogen complex. No, we haven't quite come to Jupiter yet, Darcy. We're going to get onto it next. And as Orion is a winter constellation, it's actually linked to a summer constellation. And that constellation is the constellation of Scorpius. So as Orion is setting, and we'll just do that now, you can see how it disappears down towards the west. As it disappears completely, if we go over to the southeast, so we're looking quite early in the morning, now, about half past three, we start to see Scorpius rising. And here is the claw of the scorpion going down into his heart. And this scorpion and Orion are intrinsically linked together because Orion was quite an arrogant individual. And he just was so boastful that he could kill any living creature that it upset the goddess Gaia, who was literally Mother Nature. So Gaia cracks open the earth one day and releases this giant scorpion to come and kill Orion. And the scorpion itself and Orion battled for several days until they both fell down exhausted. And it was at that point that the scorpion stung Orion in his foot. And that is why Orion has the bright star Rigel at the base of his foot. Orion was killed, but the scorpion also died in the battle itself. Now, from the UK, we don't get to see the scorpion sting. You have to go to the Mediterranean to see the full scorpion experience. But it's a wonderful part of the sky. Because where Scorpius lies, we actually have that summer Milky Way that I mentioned just appearing. And if we move it on just one more hour, you can see there's the heart or the star is known as Antares. And Antares actually means challenger to Mars. But here we get the core of our galaxy. And just there, we have the beginnings of an asterism known as the teapot. And if I go a little bit further on, here is that asterism. There's the lid of the teapot. Here is the handle. There's the bowl. And there is the spout. And when this is high in the sky, so late April, and then into May and, and July, June is not the great month to see the Milky Way, because unfortunately the skies don't get truly dark. They get this bluey color, so you miss quite a lot of it. But once it's up, then where the spout is, you could swear that it was steam forming the Milky Way. But as promised, we will look at the planets. And if we go over to where we have the rising sun, you can see a few of the planets just rising here 
at the moment. It's not the best time to go and see them, unfortunately, because they are trapped in the glare of the rising sun. But you'll get Saturn, you'll get Mercury, and you'll also have Jupiter, these three together. And also, even closer to the sun, we have the planet Venus. Now, the best time to see these planets is going to be, excuse me, a little bit later in the year. And ideally, look at around about September or August, September time. Just going to get a right month view. And then we'll go back and get the dark sky. There we go. So now we're in... Um, oh, I forgot what month we were in. It. There we go. So now we're in July. So the end of July, beginning of August. I'm going to make it just a little bit darker. There we go. And when you look at Jupiter, Jupiter is really, really bright in the sky. Saturn is, is a little bit fainter in it, but you can tell the difference between the two because Jupiter is a more of a bright white creamy color, whereas Saturn is more of a yellowy color. And Jupiter itself is wonderful in a pair of binoculars because with a pair of binoculars, you can see Jupiter's four large moons known as the Galilean satellites, named after the man who discovered them, Galileo Galilee. So there's the planet. Now the planet in binoculars is gonna look white, but then you'll have the four dots that you will easily see in those binoculars. If you've got a telescope, and this is more like the view you will see. And if you're quite fortunate and you've got good weather conditions, you'll be able to see the two equatorial bands and they look like kind of, actually they will look a little bit reddy in color, more like a salmon pink. But you'll also be able to spot this. This is a storm on Jupiter, which has been raging for the last 350 years. It's known as the Great Red Spot. And it's big. It's three and a half times the size of planet Earth and has winds averaging around about 800 miles an hour. The planet itself is 1,300 times bigger than Earth. So it's a big old lump of an object. And Saturn is smaller, but still quite sizable. It's 800 times larger than Earth. And to be honest with you, it's a lot more rewarding to look at. Now, in the binoculars, it's disappointing. I'm not going to tell you a lie because it just looks like an elongated star. But with a small telescope, this is the view you're going to get. And it just looks astonishing in a larger telescope. So I was asking about how do we know it started 350 years ago? We probably started a lot longer before but 350 years ago is when he was first spotted through a telescope and that's why we um, we see it today just notice someone's asking what software we're we using this is known as sky safari it's an apple mac product but it's identical to something called the celestron sky portal which is free and it's available on Android and Mac. So it's well worth downloading. I just put it in chat for you guys. But once you see Saturn, you'll also be able to pick up its moon Titan in a, in a relatively small telescope. Its other moons, like these few that you can see here, can only be seen in larger telescopes. So I hope you've enjoyed that uh, tour of the night sky, guys, and, and picked up some little tips. And does anybody have any questions for me? So if I try stopping my screen, I may be able to be seen again, and perhaps. Oh, I seem to have disappeared completely now. If you like to have a recording this guys it's going to be uh, available on our youtube youtube channel which is just dark sky wheels right question nope any other questions guys 
Hi, hey, Georgina. Yes, you can see the, the Milky Way from uh, the observatory in the Bracken Beacons. Um, it's actually better to look at it from the coast or on top of one of the mountains because um, you're able to see lower down. You see more across the horizon. And personally, if you're going to go Milky Way hunting, I'd recommend um, Pembrokeshire. It's brilliant for, for that kind of thing. Oh, thanks for the, the nice comments, guys. I appreciate it. Now, if you want to take pictures of the Milky Way, it's quite simple to do. Um, you do need a, a DSLR camera and a prime lens, so something like a 14 millimeter lens. But once you've got that, you can just put them all on a tripod, focus on a bright star, which is quite an easy thing to do if you've got a live screen in the back, and then just uh, take an exposure for about 20 seconds and you'll get stunning views of the Milky Way. In fact, if I can find one here, I will show you now. Um, bear with me a second because I had loads of them earlier on. There we go. Right, I'm going to try and share this, see if it works now. Right, can you see that, guys? That is the Milky Way from Pembrokeshire. And that was taken in August. And you can see how upright it is. Now, the great thing about this is that because we're near the coast, we don't have much in front of us. So like I said, the Milky Way then goes all the way down to the horizon. And it's um, it's absolutely stunning. See if we can find another one from inland. Here we go. Um, right, I'm gonna try and share that one with you now. Where's my screen gone? Yeah. And this one again. This is the April sky. Ah, uh, the Milky Way from. Uh, again, sorry, this is in um, Pembrokeshire. This is a place called Broadhaven South. And this is around about four o'clock on a um, very early morning in April. Right. For Jupiter, Darcy, you're not going to see it until July time, unfortunately, um, realistically, till you get a good view of it. Otherwise, you're going to be getting up quite early in the morning to, to spot it. Now, that doesn't stop you from seeing it, but it can be a bit of a problem if you want to take the kids out as well. Right, I'm going to just find one more for you guys so you can find it from uh, one of our other areas. Uh, bear with me a second. Might be better if I just do a search, wouldn't it? There we go. Right. So. And this is what it looks like from mid Wales. So you can see it's not quite as in depth going low to the horizon. But what you can see here are two planets. This one's Jupiter and that one is Saturn. So you can see a little bit more sometimes just by being in the right place at the right time. So is there any more questions, guys? Right then. Well, if I could ask you to just do me one last favor, I have a poll that I would like you to complete for me. It's just to uh, identify where you're from. We don't need postcodes or anything like that. Just click on a region that you live in and um, it'll help us with uh, future free events. If you did enjoy it or if you didn't enjoy it, please leave some comments on our Facebook page. Uh, that would really be helpful for us. And um, we do have some other experiences coming up free again over the next few weeks. Uh, Monday, we've got one around about the Celtic sky taken by my colleague, Martin Griffiths. And then on the 16th, we've got um, one about the Herschel family. 
Um, the le- they are basically the best astronomers um, of of the the 17th and 18th and 19th century that the UK's ever had. So thanks again, guys. Really do appreciate you attending. Hope you did enjoy it, and perhaps we'll see you again sometime soon.